So what I want to do tonight, by the grace of God, is um, paint a little picture, throw a few thoughts out there, if I may, and pray for you at the end. And then we're going to do attend to something that I believe that is close to the heart of, the go- of God when I'm done. And then we're going to have a little toilet break, hallelujah, and we're going to come back and continue the night. It's going to be incredible. So our own church will know this to be true, but of late, I have been teaching or speaking um, and framing my thoughts, my convictions around the language of heavenly calling. Everyone say heavenly calling. Heavenly calling. I've been taking some verses that I stumbled across actually back in July from Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 3, actually, um, in particular in the New Passion Translation. Um, verses that, in essence, I'm not turning there tonight, but verses that, in essence, um, encourage us that we have been made holy. Isn't that lovely? So, when we are in Christ, when we find Christ, we are made holy. That should be reassuring to someone in the room right now who's thinking that they're not worthy. If you are in Christ, you have been made holy and acceptable. It goes on and it then talks about how each and every one of us, everyone say each and every one of us, amen, has been invited to the feast of our heavenly calling. Hebrews says each and every single one of us has been invited to the feast of our heavenly calling. Not a famine, but a feast, a feast, a tailor-made, unique, beautiful, crafted, conceived in the heart of God, calling in Jesus' Name. It then goes on and it says, therefore, fasten your thoughts. As believers on the earth, we need to fasten our thoughts. We need to get some thoughts. If you have no thoughts, this is the Word of the Lord to you. You need to get some thoughts. You need to get some thoughts about God and you need to fasten those thoughts. And then Hebrews exhorts us then to continue on boldly, to continue on boldly into all that God has called us to and destined to us to in Jesus' Name. As an aside, all of that in Hebrews is in context of the house of God and the kingdom that we have actually all been um, invited to. So it's pretty profound. So in my mind, when I think about heavenly calling, I don't know what comes to your mind when you think of heavenly calling. Perhaps you might think of platform or opportunity or ministry. You know, all of those things are not wrong. They're all part of the inclusive reality of heavenly calling. But when I think of heavenly calling, what comes to mind, um, if I could make it simplistic, if I could take the idea of heavenly calling and bring it down to its most simplistic reality, I would say that heavenly calling is literally the calling home of humanity. The calling of God, it is the calling home of humanity, the beckoning home of humanity. In essence, it is the wooing, everybody say wooing. (laughs) Hashtag wooing, I love it. Okay, it is the wooing home of humanity. It is the art of being drawn home ourselves, obviously. And then it is the art in turn of turning around and being able to play a part and help draw others home. I believe that heavenly calling is the divine compass. It is the divine compass, the divine compass of God that beckons to each and every heart from eternity near and far. Think about that. It is the compass, the divine compass that beckons to every single human heart on the earth from eternity near and far. Now you might think, what is eternity near and far? Well, to be honest, I don't really know. (laughs) I mean, I kind of know, but I don't really know. But you know, you think about eternity, we're actually living in eternity right now. Newsflash, we're actually in eternity now. We just happen to be sitting in a pocket of time within eternity. And you know what? Eternity can be as close as the breath on your hand. Everyone just breathe on your hand for a moment. Gosh, who needs to clean their teeth (laughs) after a day like today? (laughs) Praise God. But you know what? Eternity is as close as the breath on your hand or it is as far reaching as our minds can perceive and then more. And so this is what I see heavenly calling as being. You know, many of you will be familiar with Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. Yeah, you're familiar with Ecclesiastes 3, 11. And literally, I'm gonna read it to you from the Amplified. It says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. 
He has made everything beautiful in His time. Now, I just wanna pause here on a pastoral note and say on that top line, that should be reassuring to people and I want it to be reassuring to people. He has made everything beautiful in its time. And if you are going through a tough season, if you are in a challenge, if you are facing something insurmountable, as Joel and the team ministered to earlier in worship, I wanna, I wanna encourage you that we have a God who is able, actually He is able to make everything beautiful in its time. Within time and eternity, He is able. He is a God who is I was gonna say not flabbergasted with our lives. He is a God who is able. He's a God who um, is the God of the impossible. There is always a place of escape, a place of landing in God. Anything that comes against us, He can turn around. Anything that the enemy means for evil against us, actually, He can turn around. So you know what? Take heart, my sweethearts. Do you know what? He has made everything. He is able to make everything in your world beautiful in its time. That was for free. Then it goes on and it says, and He has also planted what? Eternity in men's hearts. He has planted eternity in men's hearts and minds. Everyone say hearts and minds. Okay, a divinely implanted sense of a purpose working through the ages, which nothing under the sun but God alone can satisfy. He has planted eternity in men's hearts and minds. And you know, again, we should just pause here and take heart. Because if you have a heart for the lost, if you have a heart for the harvest, if you have a heart for those in your world near to you perhaps, who don't have any disposition or any inclination towards God, take heart because God has actually planted eternity in their minds and their hearts. And we just have to find a way to trigger that. And you know what, for some it might be buried, for some they might be in denial, but nevertheless, God has planted eternity in men's hearts and minds. And so you know what, on that note, I honestly believe that our responsibility as followers of Christ, everyone say responsibility. Our responsibility as followers of Christ, our responsibility as um, creatives, of thy kingdom come. We are creatives of thy kingdom come. If you, ever, if you have ever prayed the Lord's Prayer over anyone, you are a creative. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. If you have ever prayed that you are a creative in prayer, in that note, you are a creative of thy, thy kingdom come. And so I believe that our responsibility again as followers as creatives of that is to endlessly point and play to that divinely implanted compass that tugs on every single human heart. Our responsibility is to point to it and play to it in Jesus' Name. Point to it, play to it, prophetically create or craft to it, unveil it, make it known make it felt through the senses of what you have been entrusted and gifted with, in Jesus' Name. Do you know when I think about our human senses, what are our human senses? Can you riddle them off? Exactly. <laughs> you know, our human senses are, are fairly remarkable, but they are limited to this earthly realm. But I honestly believe that when the Spirit of God, when the Spirit of truth, when the Spirit of revelation gets on those senses, when it comes alive in us, we can take those senses into a whole different realm. When the Spirit of God, when the Spirit of truth, when the Spirit of revelation comes alive in us, all right, let me read to you from Ephesians chapter five. It says, once your life was full of sin's darkness, but now you have the very light of our Lord shining through you because of your union with Him. Our mission is to live as children flooded with His revelation light. Verse nine, and then the supernatural fruits of His light will be seen in you goodness, righteousness, and truth, verse 10, then you will learn to choose what is beautiful to our Lord. Guys, leave that one on the screen for one minute. I keep giving you little freebies here. 
then you will learn to choose what is beautiful to our Lord. Not perhaps what is beautiful to us, but beautiful to our Lord. Because sometimes in the creative realm, we wanna make what is beautiful to us. We wanna create our canvas. And you know what? There is a degree where I believe the Lord of heaven, the creator of the universe looks down and He delights in what delights us. And He loves that. But then I think there are times also when the Lord might actually say, you know what? As beautiful as that thing is that you are creating right now, I need you to bring that over here and I need you to attach this to my will. We need to bring what is beautiful to the Lord and what is beautiful to His will. And sometimes that can be um, a negative reality, a tension, a negative tension in the life of creatives. It's like, but God, I wanna make this beautiful thing. I wanna create this. I wanna be whatever. And God is saying, it's lovely. That's beautiful. Knock yourself out of Nepe. But do you know what, really? I need you to bring that over here. I need you to attach that to thy kingdom come. I need you to submit that and tenderly bring that before my will and allow it to play a part in my greater plan. In Jesus' Name, Amen. Amen. And so again, verse nine, if I can go there, verse nine, it says, and the supernatural fruit, not the natural fruit, but the supernatural fruit of His light will be seen in you. Goodness, righteousness and truth. Leave it up there. Goodness, righteousness and truth, supernatural, not natural, but supernatural. Is anyone in this room hungry for a supernatural fruit in your life? Not just fruit, I mean, fruit is fruit and fruit is good, but I'm talking about something that is supernatural, that has the breath of God, that X factor, something upon it, that is the supernatural breath of God that can take our goodness beyond human goodness. There's a lot of good goodness in the world. The world isn't all bad. She isn't all evil. There's a lot of good stuff out there. But you know what? God in our lives, in the body of Christ, hallelujah, He wants to take our goodness to a supernatural goodness. He wants to take our righteousness to a supernatural rightness. There's a lot of rightness in the world. Again, it's not all bad, but God's going, "Mm, but there's a better way. There is a greater, there is a, (laughs) there is a greater righteousness to be known. And then definitely truth. Truth beyond human truth. And there is truth out there. But again, we're talking about a supernatural truth. So tonight, if I may, I just wanna touch on the nature of truth and the irresistible nature of truth. And I wanna speak to us just a little bit as artisans of truth. Is that okay? Artisans of truth. Allow me just to try and paint a little picture for you here. Oh, there goes my fisherman friend, hallelujah. Which is a peppermint, by the way. But I just wanna paint a little bit of a picture here. And um, you know, when I was little, um, okay, I found, (laughs) when I was little, I found a picture of when I was little and it's really got nothing to do with anything, but would you like to see it? Okay, it's gonna go on the screens, um, I think. Here I am! But I grew up in an era where there was no cameras hardly and we had no cameras. So I have about three pictures of me when I was a child and I thought this was so adorable that you needed to see that because what is not to love about a little girl, I don't know if I am seven, eight or nine, in a homemade pink gingham puffy bikini (laughs) with a random cat. Can you see the cat down here? A random, that's not my cat. I have no idea whose cat that is. Just a random cat walks across the only picture I have of my childhood. Anyway, adorable. Brian, do you love that? I think my mother made my bikini hoping that I would grow into my bikini. Anyway, it has nothing to do with anything. But when I was little, you can take it off now because it's like distracting even me. Hallelujah. Um, When I was little, and many of you will know this because really it's my testimony. And when you have a testimony, you tell your testimony, right? (laughs) <laughs> but when I was little, I had the most remarkable relationship with my father. And I've spoken of it again and I've written of it many, many times. And, you know, he was remarkable. I would fall asleep in his arms every night of my life. Yeah. I, um, he gave my sister and I breakfast in bed every single day of our lives, two poached eggs on toast. 
um, to the day he died. Um, and I would often come home from school and because he was a trader, he would come home early and, and prepare dinner for my mum who came home at seven o'clock. And uh, we would sit on the back porch and he would make me homemade chips. Everyone say chips with a Kiwi accent, chips. Homemade chips wrapped in newspaper, broken open at the top so the steam could get out. And we would sit there and we would eat these chips and a beer. That's how I was raised, sitting on the back porch with my dad, having homemade chips and a beer. <laughs> it may have been a shandy, actually, which is half lemonade and half beer. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Anyone feel like a shandy right now? <laughs> I have a beer about once a year, all right, in memory of my dad. Anyway, praise the Lord. Okay, if anyone's watching from somewhere in the world, don't get all bent out of shape. <laughs> Seriously. There are bigger issues, right? I'm not talking about drunkenness on the back steps after school. I'm just talking about having a bear with my father. Anyway. <laughs> all right, settle down. Okay, my dad was a World War II veteran and he died when I was 14. So deep was the loss, so deep was the separation. And again, I've told this, that I would lie in my little bed in New Zealand, I would draw back the night curtains and I would look at the night sky, the stars, I would look at the night sky and I would somehow sense that He had to exist. Like, how could He not exist? And I, I mean, my, my, my reasoning as a child was, how could such a remarkable human being suddenly cease to exist? And so I would look at the vastness of the night sky, what I knew to be the heavens and what I knew to be the universe, and I would somehow sense that He had to be. So as a young 14-year-old, eternity was actually calling me. Remember, I read to you from Ecclesiastes, eternity was calling, the heavens were calling, the compass within, that divinely implanted sense of something greater was actually calling to me. Somewhere in that space, everyone say somewhere in that space. Somewhere in that space, um, I coerced a little girlfriend of mine, Margaret, to um, walk across our suburb, right across the suburb, and attend what was our family church. We were Anglican, but we never went. I was christened an Anglican, but we never went but I knew it to be our family church for some reason. So we walked right across the suburb to attend. And we sat in the service and mid-service, the minister um, released the children, go to Sunday school. It's time for Sunday school. We didn't know what to do. So we moved into the foyer, the lobby, and no one sadly noticed us. No one spoke to us. We didn't know what to do. So we lingered and then we walked all the way home. But you know what, something within the idea of truth, or rather something within the idea of church was beckoning me, was calling me. Something within the idea of church. Somewhere in that space, I um, would come home from school with that same friend, God bless her, <laughs> and I would make her sit down with me after school and look at this giant Bible, this giant, giant Bible like the picture down here. And I would make her sit there after school and we would look at the pictures. I would look at all these old ancient pinch pictures. And um, I'm not sure that she was particularly interested, but I made her. And I would look at them and it was like something, something within the Renaissance art, some, something within the art was actually tugging at my heart. Somewhere in that space, I accidented across a magazine back in the 70s. It was a teenage girl magazine called Seventeen. Is there anyone ancient enough in the room to remember this? Any girls, any women, older women? I'm 61, all right, down here. You remember this, it was the, the magazine of the day, wasn't it? So somewhere in that space, I accidented across this. And I remember being mesmerised by an article that had been written in there about the Jesus people in the early 70s, the Jesus people. I remember just being mesmerised by it. And there was something about the words. There was something about the words and the narrative. There was something about the photography 
capturing this Jesus people thing that was actually compelling me that there was something more. I remember actually at the time reading this article, I was a little girl, I remember reading it thinking, oh, I wish I had something like that. (laughs) Not realising what they had, despite the fact that it said it was about the Jesus people. The Jesus people. And I'm like, oh, I wish I had something like that. I didn't realise it was Jesus. And you might think, well, how could you not? It's not that I was dull of thinking. It wasn't that I didn't have the capacity to join the dots. It's just that the truth that was drawing me was still veiled. Somewhere in that space, I heard that there was a rock opera called Jesus Christ Superstar. Back in the 70s, the Jesus, does anyone remember this? And I heard that um, in New Zealand that on the radio, they were gonna play the entire track. So I sat there and I waited all weekend for the radio to play the entire track of Jesus Christ Superstar, waiting to record it onto my father's reel-to-reel recorder. That's how ancient I am, people. I waited all weekend and I recorded it. And then I listened and I listened and I listened to what was a secular but very used of God musical. And again, something within the music The lyric, the lyric, the words, Mary Magdalene singing, I don't know how to love Him. What to do, He moves me. I sat there all weekend listening to this, listening to the energy, listening to the passion, listening to the creative, the creativity of this rock opera musical. You know, somewhere in that space, I remember finding myself in front of our television. So this is a long time ago. And I found myself watching this, uh, it was like a current affair type program back in New Zealand. And they were doing a piece on the apparent Jesus revolution that was happening in the country. And I remember looking at the television set and suddenly the camera panned across this, they were, were recording this church service that was happening in Auckland. And this little church that actually was the biggest church in New Zealand, there was a move of God happening and the camera pans across and then suddenly in my lounge room, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's my friend. It is my friend from school. It is Lily Scaletta, Elizabeth. Oh my goodness. And she was there and she had her hands raised and her eyes closed and she was singing and there was this peace and this like something and this presence about her. And I remember, oh my gosh, it was like something in a media report. Something in a media piece was actually, it actually arrested my attention. Do you know, somewhere in the space of all that, there were literally journalists, there were photographers, there were newspaper people, there were cameras, there was no end of reality happening and they were all capturing a move of God that was happening across the world. And somewhere in all of that space, A young girl, a young, fair-skinned, (laughs) gentle-spirited, she looked so Puritan. Literally, this young girl, she took the gap at school on a Friday afternoon and she extended to me an invitation to come to her church. An invitation that actually was the final link in a plan that the Spirit of God had been orchestrating for months, if not years, And you know, that night, truth found its target. That night, truth found its target and the thin veil that had concealed the one who was drawing me was removed. Now listen, church, I'm talking to a room full of creative people. All those elements, all of those elements contributed to my salvation story, all of them. All of these elements became powerful connecting dots in the story. Artisans, ancient artists, church builders, carriers of revival, carriers of revolution, writers, storytellers, journalists, editors, composers, musicians, performers, actors, technicians, everyday people using their everyday skill, God used the power of truth 
in their collective work. God used the power of truth in their collective work, regardless of whether it was secular or Christian. Because back in the day in the 70s, the church certainly wasn't on the forefront of creativity. And God used this. I don't know whether, I don't know, who, I don't know. <laughs> but God used it. And you know what? It drew me home. And I think many of you in this room could tell that same story. So this evening, I wanna challenge us as artisans of truth to allow God's power, His Holy Spirit power, His dunamis power, His power from on high to be poured out upon you and to be fiercely at work in your work. Because I believe that our God-given gifts, our God-given gifts are given to help that eternal compass do its work. That's why they are given. They're not given for fame nor fortune, but if fame or fortune comes your way, God bless you. Be blessed to be a blessing. They're not given for our own agenda, ego, whatever. God-given gift, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. And in this time frame, they are given to help that eternal compass inside every man, woman and child do its work. You know, when I consider truth, I see several realities. They're gonna go on the screen. I believe truth always reveals Christ. I believe that truth always leads to freedom. I believe truth always evokes hunger and holiness. And I believe that truth always attracts opposition. So let me just give you a handful of thoughts because on any one of these, we could actually teach an ocean of truth. And I have no capacity to do that, nor time. Hallelujah. I'm not trying to do that. I'm not trying to be a Bible college tonight. I'm not trying to give an argument for everything. I'm just trying to bring the one thread that I believe God has laid upon my heart. So when it comes to number one, the first thing, truth always reveals Christ. Number one, it does, it always reveals Christ. John chapter 14, if you're taking notes, John 14 verse six, Jesus declares, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now we know and love this. You could all recite it. Recite it for me. Excellent work. <laughs> well done, class. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We've actually been singing new songs tonight with that lyric and that truth and those words within it. You know, when I ponder and I pause and I look at it, for sure, do you know what? I feel like they are possibly the most powerful, the most inclusive, the most definitive, the most haunting and the most miraculous words that have ever been spoken. Truly, that Christ would come and stand and declare that He is the way, the truth and the life. And you know, He spoke, if you look at the context of chapter 14, He is speaking those words over His disciples to allay their fear. He's beginning to disclose to them the things that must take place and their human minds have no capacity to truly grasp. So He allays their fear. He puts to rest their fear by saying these things. Then He quite interestingly goes on to prophesy of the Holy Spirit. Let me read to you 14 verse 15 through. It says, Jesus says, loving me, empowers you to obey my commands. Can I stop here? Loving you, loving me rather, loving me. Jesus says, loving me empowers you to obey my commands. If you're struggling to obey Him tonight, can I just suggest that you go back to first love? If you're really struggling as a, as a follower of Christ to obey, to surrender, to yield to His good, good way, I challenge you, find your first love again or cultivate a first love. Jesus goes on and He says, and I will ask the Father, isn't He lovely? And I will ask the Father and He will give you another Saviour, the Holy Spirit of truth, who will be with you, who will be to you a friend just like me and He will never leave you. What a promise. The world won't receive Him because they can't see Him and know Him. 
but you will know Him intimately because He will make His home in you and will live inside of you. So much that could be said. You know, the night I got saved, the night I went to church with Lily, but her brother picked us up in his triumph and took us to church. Somewhere in that night, the preacher must have said, Jesus is the way, the life and the truth. He must have said it because how else would I have known it? And I clearly remember it being part of the equation that was in the, that my coming to, to, to salvation. And so he must have said that. But if he had said that, oh God, help me, Lord. If he had, he's, if he had said that and he did, okay, he said it. At that point, okay, I'm going back to my night of salvation. The preacher says, he is the way, the truth and the life. I am listening. At that point, Christ is not revealed to me. Words are just being spoken to me. But as I leant into the truth within those words, as I leant into truth, the truth within me resonated with the truth that was drawing me. And the magnetic nature of truth unveiled truth. The magnetic nature of truth revealed, unveiled, opened my eyes to truth. So our challenge, my darlings, our challenge is to write and to speak and to sing and to produce words that carry truth. There are so many words out there and they're beautiful and they're good and they're awesome, but we are commissioned to bring words of truth when there is a revelation, when the spirit of revelation, the spirit of truth is at work in our craft, in what we bring, there is a whole different dynamic at play because the magnetic nature of truth, eternal, is doing its work. They're not shallow words. They're words that are alive in Christ. They're words that have the capacity to penetrate and go into that homing device that God has put within every single man, woman and child. And you think, well, how do we find truth? This world is swirling with apparent truth. It's rubbish. There's so much lie and innuendo and nonsense going on out there. And we carry truth and you think, well, what is truth? Well, you know what? Truth is found within the Word of God. It is found within the Word of God. In fact, Psalm 119, 160 says, the sum of your Word is truth. The sum of your Word is truth. So if you want to be an artisan of truth, hallelujah, This Word is not optional in your life. In whatever you do, this Word is not optional. And I'm preaching this to myself here. This Word is not optional. If we're gonna be true artisans of truth in these coming days. The second thing, I believe truth always leads to freedom, right? It always leads to freedom, hallelujah. John chapter 8, 31. The Word declares, if you abide in my Word, Jesus, if you abide in my Word, you are truly my disciples. You are truly, if you abide in that Word, if you abide. You are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. We know that to be true, right? How many would testify to that? The truth has set you free and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Exactly. Again, so much could be said, but I just wanna take this one thought. Do you know that, forgive me, I present it to you. Sadly, life on this planet is sometimes a long walk to freedom for some. So here the Word declares, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. It's true, it's real. It can be instant, it can be outworked. But you know what, for some, for some in this world, it is a long walk to freedom. And it just is. This world has fallen, It is broken, it is full of injustice. And you know what, some, now this will mess with some theology, but some won't see their justice, their true freedom, their true justice, this side. And that is not to be dismissive of truth or grace or hope or blessing, but the reality is, and there are ancients in the Word of God who never, they hoped in hope, they never lost their faith, but they never secured it this side. They never secured their full freedom this side. They secured it on the other side. 
But when it's all said and done, and when this life ends and the next begins, do you know what? Truth and freedom will prevail. It will prevail. So take heart in the goodness of God. Take heart in the, in the eternal providence of God. You know, it's like a, there might be a couple and you've lost a child. And you're wrestling to understand why you've lost your child. Maybe your freedom to understand will not be known this side. It will be known on the other side. So you know, freedom, truth brings freedom, but there's a reality to it. And it doesn't diminish our faith and it doesn't diminish our hope. It's just sometimes a reality of life. And sometimes, like I said, not sometimes, but like I just said, sometimes we just gotta trust in the goodness of a good God. And what we don't understand here and now, we will understand one day. Because truth does bring freedom and truth will prevail and freedom will prevail and joy will come and He will wipe away your tears. In the meantime, stop wrestling with your pain. Stop wrestling with your loss. Get on with life. Get on with life in Jesus' Name, amen. Sorry, I don't, I just felt to say it. You know, about six weeks ago, um, I was in Uganda. I wanna show you a picture of um, the girls, my girls in Uganda. I had the opportunity to take with Kathy Clark from London. We took um, a handful, a good handful of our lead pastor girls to Uganda to expose them to the work of Compassion and also Watoto. <clears throat> and it was remarkable. And so we visited lots and lots of um, different projects. And then we had this one particular day where Compassion organised for us to actually spend a few hours and to actually step into the shoes of one of the Compassion mothers, one of the deep, you know, deeply impoverished Compassion families um, who no doubt hopefully have a child in their family sponsored as a Compassion child. So we got to do this and... Um, we got to actually go and draw water with them from a water project that Compassion had um, created. And if they had not created that water project, we would have been drawing water with these girls from a muddy hole. And so we literally carried water back up the hill and to their little enclave of homes. And I got to actually share my day with this beautiful woman here. Her name is Juliet. Is there another image of her? So we walked to Juliet's little house and then we were greeted by her and her family. She's um, 35 years of age. She has eight children, one grandchild, a husband. They live in the most impoverished reality. I can't even begin to describe it. Minimal. Another image, and so we got to actually share life and we went and we um, cut plantain down with her and we carried the leaves and we stripped them and then we sat and we actually began to um, prepare her the meal with her family. Do you have another one? Do you have the one of me peeling plantain? I don't know, not necessarily. Okay, no worries. And so here she is, Juliet, a beautiful woman. Her honour that day, her honour that day, her honour was to welcome us to her home. And she laid out what she had and then she prayed for us. For us. Her honour was to pray for us. And in her native tongue, she prayed the Lord's prayer over us and it was felt. And I look at Juliet's life and I think, man, alive. I cut plantain with her. She doesn't even have a knife. She had two rusty blades. That's all she had. I'm like, why didn't we take knives? Why didn't we take a veggie peeler? Why didn't we do any of that? Clueless. And I look at her and I think, you know what? Outside of a miracle for Uganda, her true justice is a woman who loves God, who's doing the very best with her family. Her true justice may not be seen this sign. Really, her true freedom. But you know what? One day, one day, someday, she's gonna cross the line and she's gonna be welcomed home and there's gonna be a mansion in heaven for her. So freedom has a journey. And so I just wanna challenge us, don't fall for the deceptive nature of this world. Don't fall for it. Don't become a victim of this world or to this world. Because honestly, if you allow yourself to become a victim, this world, the lie will take you captive. So don't fall victim. Live to be an overcomer, not only in this life, but in the life to come. 
or not only in that life to come, but in this life also. And I wanna challenge us to live to be agents and carriers and examples of freedom. Do you know what, if you haven't read the book of Revelation recently, have another read. There's a blessing promised if you read it. You don't have to fully understand it, just read it. And um, you will see that there are two prevailing realities in the book of Revelation, which is the revealing of Christ in His glory. There are two prevailing realities, Christ and His bride. Christ and His maturing, rising church. And I heard a friend once say many years ago that God doesn't anoint government to heal the brokenhearted, He anoints the church. So if you wanna be on the forefront of thy kingdom come, and freedom, get into and make your church the healthiest, most alive, vibrant, pulsating, with saving power church ever in Jesus' Name, amen? The church, third thing, truth. Truth always evokes hunger and holiness. (laughs) Oh my God, that would be hilarious. Truth always evokes hunger and holiness. John chapter 18, says Pilate, Jesus has been brought before the jury. He is entering into that remarkable moment where he lays down his life for the likes of you and I. And he's brought before Pilate and Pilate says to him, so you're a king. And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born and for this purpose I have come into the world to be a witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And then Pilate says to him, what is truth? Pilate asks the question, what is truth? Do you know, I believe that truth will always evoke hunger. Whether a soul accepts or rejects that truth is up to them, but it will always evoke inquiry. So again, so much could be said But honestly, I wanna exhort us to live and to give, to live honest and clean and pure, and you will make people thirsty. You will evoke a hunger and a thirst within them. And I wanna challenge us to give the world an irresistible dose of truth. Come on, people. Let's not give them sham. Let's not give them something half-baked, lukewarm, worthy of being spewed out of God's mouth, he says. Let's give them an irresistible dose of truth. Hallelujah. Let's give them something that is honest and upright and worthy. And you know, on a personal note, note, I was thinking about holiness. Dear Lord, what can you say here? This holiness, it's a mystery, right? On a personal note, holiness. And I was thinking, you know what? Truth, given half a chance, will walk us all up the mountain. It will, it will compel us, it will walk us up this mountain. And you know, the the theme of this conference is ascent. Psalm 24, it says, "'Who shall ascend into the mountain of the Lord? "'Who shall stand in His holy hill? "'He who has clean hands and a pure heart.'" And when I think of holiness, and I'm just throwing a handful of little thoughts out to you and I'm gonna be done shortly. (laughs) Praise the Lord, but we're here till midnight, people. Um, You know what, holiness, It doesn't actually mean that you can't start the ascent if your hands are dirty and your heart is cluttered. It doesn't mean that. If your your hands are dirty and your heart is cluttered, you can start the ascent. But I pretty much promise you that the ascent will burn off the dross and the ascent will purify the walk. And... The end of the matter when it comes to holiness is actually found in uh, the final chapter of Revelation. And again, I'm not gonna read it, but honestly, I sense that holiness isn't about inclusion or exclusivity or not, because we are all included and we are all invited. But perhaps holiness is more about whether you are going to actually enter in. You're included, you're invited, we all are. But holiness, what is this thing, the holiness? Does anyone this side of eternity have the measure to talk about the holiness of God? 
But you read Revelation, you think maybe it's more about entering in to all that He has prepared and not being held outside of that. It's about entering in and not being on the other side. Let me read to you from Revelation 22, of course, I'm gonna go there. Behold, Jesus says, I am coming soon and I shall bring my wages and rewards with me to repay and to render to each one just with what his own actions and his own works merit. Those are big words, wages, rewards, to repay and to render to each one according to their own actions or their own works. Verse 13, Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the before all and the end of all. In verse 14, He says, blessed, happy and to be envied are those who cleanse their garments. Blessed, happy to be envied are those who cleanse their garments. Blessed are those who cleanse their garments. Like, what does that mean? Blessed are those who cleanse their garments. Surely we don't cleanse our garments, do we? Doesn't Jesus cleanse our garments? Do you know what? At the point of salvation, we are all given garments of salvation. The old is replaced with the new. We are given the robes of righteousness. We are given clean garments. But I wanna ask the question, in the journey, can we soil those garments? Those beautiful garments of salvation, can we soil them? In the journey, I certainly have. I got my garments of salvation at 15 in that story I told. Have I soiled my garments in that journey? Yeah, I have. I have lived beneath my potential. I have done things I shouldn't do. I've had moments where I've repented for things that were not pleasing to the heart of God, I am sure. And you know, you think, here, what does it say? And it says, blessed are those who cleanse their garments. We don't cleanse our garments on our own. We cleanse our garments by going to the foot of the cross yet again. We cleanse our garments by repenting and saying, Father, I have fallen short. Search me, Holy Spirit. Know what is within me. That's how we cleanse our garments. It goes on and it says that they may have authority and right to approach the tree of life and to enter through the gates into the city. But sadly, without, okay, I'm talking about enter, those who can enter and those who stay without. Without are the dogs and those who practise sorceries, magic arts and impurity, the lured and the adulterous, the murderers, idolaters and everyone who loves and deals in falsehood, untruth, error, deception, cheating. Verse 16, I, Jesus, loving Jesus, says, I have sent my messenger angel to you to witness and to give you assurance of these things for the churches. I am the root and the source and the offspring of David, the radiant and the brilliant morning star. And then he says, and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Oh, we love the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And the bride, the church, the true, the true Christians say, come. And let him who is listening say, come. And let everyone come who is thirsty, who is painfully conscious of his need of those things by which the soul is refreshed and supported and strengthened. And whoever earnestly desires to do it, let him come take appropriate and drink of the water of life without cost. Holiness, people, it's a mystery. I don't pretend to even understand and I'm a little bit like afraid that I'm actually standing here saying this. What is holiness? Do you know what holiness I think is, is way more? Holy, 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 holy. Holy is way more than a four letter word that we sing as a refrain in a song. Holy, holy, holy. You know, tonight, if by chance we sing holy, 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 I pray that we just won't sing it, but I pray that we will lay our sin down, that we will lay the things that weigh us down, we will lay it down, let the dross fall and enter into the presence of God, enter into who you are and created in Christ, in Jesus' Name, Amen. And the team are gonna join me. And truth, I'm gonna just do this quick, truth always attracts opposition, it does. So I wanna say artisans of truth, hallelujah, work you wonder wearing the armour of God. All right, if you're gonna work your wonder, wear it, work it, wearing the armour of God. John 8, 44 says the devil, it says of the devil that he is the father of untruth. 
His nature, His nature is to twist truth and His nature at work within the sons of men who don't want to know truth is to twist the truth. Our responsibility, our role, our mission is to unravel the truth, to make the truth known and felt. So I wanna say our challenge is to live again as children flooded with revelation light. Our challenge is before you put on your creative thinking cap, put on your Ephesians 6 armour of God. Put it on because this fight for this generation, this fight for the sons and daughters of this generation is not just a picnic in the park, it is a battle. And if, you wanna, if we wanna be artisans of truth, hallelujah, we've gotta put on that armour because all hell will come against you. My son said to me the other night, oh, I didn't sleep well, I had fierce dreams. I didn't actually even ask because I actually understand that when you start to get in an environment like this and lead an environment like this, all hell comes against you. Spiritual activity is, is um, stirred up. And so we have to put on the armour of God. I wanna say to you that there is an enemy out there and he, his mission is to infiltrate and to poison and to alienate the sons of men from their Creator. And I wanna say that the devil is in his death throes. He is in his final death throes. He is the accuser of the brethren. And I don't know if a literal antichrist will ever materialise like we sometimes imagine he might. But let's remember that Christ in the Gospel says the spirit of antichrist already exists and it is in the world. And so what we are fighting is not a small thing, we are fighting a heavenly battle. And can I remind us that um, Revelation says that He is the accuser of the brethren. So how shall He come against us? With accusation. And so be mindful of that in Jesus' Name, Amen. Again, His nature is to twist truth. Our mission, Ephesians 5.18, I read to you at the front end again, is to be children flooded with His revelation, light in Jesus' Name, Amen. And can I remind you that when it comes to spiritual activity, when it comes to opposition, we have been singing, there's another one in the fire. There's another one in the water, right? We've been singing that. Well, can I remind you that that other one is God of the angel armies. And not only do we have another one in the fire and another one in the water, we have the host of heaven. And I remember on a Sunday night when we first moved into this building and all hell was coming against us as a church and did so for the next 15 or 20 years and still isn't over. I remember being down there in worship and like the church had been dismissed, but we lingered and we went hard into the presence of God. Like we're gonna go hard into the presence of God tonight at our midnight mass of hallelujah. But listen to me, as I worship God, knowing the onslaught, knowing the attack was coming, do you know what? It was like God opened my spirit eyes and I saw the heavens rend and out there, Yeah, out there, actually, in that direction, I saw the heavens open and part and I saw legions of armies, legions of angels come and land, land with such accuracy and with such intention. They landed all around this campus with their swords raised, giant angels with their swords raised. And I felt God say, whilst their swords are raised, nothing will touch this church. Nothing will touch what is precious to God. So can I remind you, we have God of the angel armies in the room tonight, hallelujah. Amen. And those angels will never lower their sword while the high praises of God are happening in here. And whilst truth prevails in Jesus' Name, amen. I've gone so over time, 15 minutes. Praise the Lord, I'm done. Praise the Lord. So I wanna pray for you. If you're a writer, I wanna pray that you will scribe according to the heart of God that you will scribe according to the heart of God. Can I show you something? It's gonna go on the screens just real quick and then I'm gonna be done. I wanna show you something, okay? Beautiful. Okay. A few years ago, I read a a book about a woman who had a vision of heaven. Now, if you're into that, awesome. If you're not, don't worry about it, all right? It resonated with me. And basically she had this vision where she went and she had conversations with Jesus and it was all about this beautiful gift. And when she opened it, there was a pen. There was this beautiful pen because she's a writer and she scribes. And the Spirit, of, in this vision, God said to her literally these words, this, this is Jesus speaking to her. 
He says, this is your pen, beloved. When you write, you will write by the shed blood of my Son and by the fire of my Holy Spirit. Without it, your words hold no power to change lives. With it, beloved child, a great impartation of my love. <sighs> with, it, with it, beloved child, a great impartation of my love. A great healing shall flow from the pages you write into the hearts and minds of those who read it. And He laid it tenderly on His table. And He said, I shall keep it for you here. Never write without coming here first and picking up the pen from me. When I turned 60, Gary and Kathy Clark gave me this beautiful pen, this beautiful Princess Grace collection pen down here. And Kathy, for some reason, wrote that vision that so resonated with me. I wanna exhort you in the same way Jesus exhorted that woman. Never write without going to the throne room of God. Write words of truth. Let the fire of God be upon you. Amen. If you're an artist or a designer, I pray that the manifold glory of God will be upon you. The word manifold literally means the many tints and hues and colourful expressions of God's goodness, glory entering the human arena. I pray that that will be your portion in Jesus' Name. You know what, if you're a communicator, May your tongue be shaped and sharp and guided. In the words of Martin Smith of Delirious, history maker, I wanna be a speaker of truth to all mankind. Whatever your gift is in Jesus' Name, whatever your gift is, my prayer is that it will be smeared with the Spirit of God. If you wanna, if you have a gift on your life, if you have a gift on your life and you're aware of that, and there's anything within you that goes, Father, I wanna lay this on the altar one more time. I wanna lay my gift, my measure, the talent, the, what you've given. If I want, Father, I wanna lay it on the altar again. I want your fire to touch it. I want you to stand to your feet and I wanna pray with you. Do you wanna say, Father, I wanna lay it on your altar. Father, I wanna lay it on your altar. One more time, I wanna bring it. Like the Father said to that lady, I wanna bring it. If that's you, amen. If you're in your lounge room, if you're watching this on a computer, if you're watching this, maybe doing a night shift and you're all by yourself, but somehow you're watching this, talking to you, stand in your heart, amen. If that's you and you're able, I want you, go to, I want you to go to your knees. I want you to go to your knees if you can. I'm gonna pray for you. If there's no room to kneel, just sit back on the edge of your seat. Lift it heavenward, lift whatever you have heavenward. Some of you are graced with many gifts for such a time as this. Always remember that the gift is given unto the calling, which is given unto the planting, which is given unto the cause of Christ. Never forget that. Let me pray for you. Let me pray for us together. Heavenly Father, with humility of heart, we thank You for every good and perfect thing that You have ever given us, for our salvation, for our robes of righteousness, our salvation garments, we thank You. Father, if our garments are soiled, if they're stained by life, Father God, I pray that tonight as we worship You, that God, You will wash us clean again, wash us pure and new again. We repent, we lean into You. And Father, this gift that You have entrusted, the gifts that You have entrusted for such a time as this, Jesus, You have entrusted gifts to this generation for a reason. Father God, we humbly ask that You would just take them again. We lay them at Your feet and we ask that God, You would bless them and You would sanctify them and that You would anoint them afresh. Father God, our hearts are Yours. We make a fresh devotion and dedication of our lives. We give our lives afresh to You. And we say, come Holy Spirit like fire, come like breath, come like wind and take our hearts and cause them to count and cause them to be all that You saw, all that You know in Jesus' Name. Amen, amen. You can